Hello guys and gals and welcome, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. So this is a video that I've been meaning to make for a while. Um, and uh, no matter what game you play, Diablo 2, Diablo 3, Diablo 4, Last Epoch, Path of Exile, you may be interested in this video. Today we're going to be talking about itemization. It's not going to be talking about any one specific game, but more or less talking about itemization in general and what itemization actually means to a video game. So what is itemization? Right? First off, you have to understand what itemization actually is. And I think there's no greater place to start than let's go ahead and actually read what freaking uh, some of the Diablo actual developers had to say on itemization and what they think about some of the new integrations of itemization, like within Diablo 3, Diablo 4, and other games. Um, as well as, honestly, even we could incorporate uh, MMOs. Uh, things like World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy uh, 14, Final Fantasy 11, and so forth and so on. Um, and to do this, what we're going to do is I'm going to bring up a uh, page here, and we're going to start off with uh, something that I think is going to define itemization very well. Um, and this is a Moonbeast post um, from the Diablo developers. Uh, they're working on a, a whole new game, basically. Um, and this is going to kind of go over some of that stuff for us so we can talk about this. So first, let's just read what he says. So what do we mean by itemization that feels like Diablo 2? To replicate the feel of a system, you would have to first all, of all understand how it works and what about it is good. Without that, any fixes or improvements you try to make risk throwing the baby out the bathwater. But itemization is a complicated system with tons of moving parts. It's very hard to get it right. Thankfully, we have Eric Schaefer on the team, uh, every bit as much as David Brevik, the father of Diablo. Eric is the father of ARPG itemization, among many other aspects of ARPG design. Without him, we wouldn't have random items at all. I'm sure you'd rather hear from him directly, but Eric's got this closed-lip Germanic thing going on, so I'm going to try and write down all the things I've learned from him, and he'll step in and correct me if I'm wrong, and hopefully you'll get a sense of what the Moonbeast philosophy toward itemization is. Topic number one. Systems where items generally scale with eye level suck platypus balls. Now, this is um, proof in the pudding of exactly what I'm saying, because I've also felt this for a very long time, that systems like World of Warcraft, uh, systems like Diablo 4, for instance, um, that basically scale based on the eye level of an item, tend to be really crappy. Now, Diablo 4 doesn't have it so bad, because once you get to... Item power 725, anything over item power 725 is essentially equivalent to a 925, with the exception of weapons. And that's where things get kind of sketchy with Diablo 4. Uh, World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy 14 incorporated item power into items. And, uh, and in generally, uh, eye level is probably one of the worst mechanics for itemization known to man. And there's a reason for this. Um, it has to do with the fact that you're basically just cutting a large portion of your items completely out of play. Uh, let me give you an example. Mage Fists, which are in Diablo 2, are relatively low-level gloves. Um, I believe you can wear them at, what, level 29 or something like that? I can't remember the exact level, but they're relatively low-level. However, Mage Fists are still, to this day, among the best gloves that sorceresses and casters can wear, right? Depending, of course. Trangles um, also has a good place within the cold sorceresses and whatnot. But basically, you have an item, which is a low-level item, which can still be used by the highest-level characters. This is a good thing. In Diablo 4, if I found a pair of gloves at level 29, <laughs> the idea of using those level 29 gloves at level 100 is so laughable that uh, if my friends found out that I was doing so, I would literally get, like, laughed out of the kinship, and also they would take screenshots of my terrible gloves and make a meme out of them. And you start to see how eye level really kind of ruins a system which could otherwise be amazing. Um, unless you're a modder, you might not be familiar with the term eye level. In short, it's the level of the item which is based on the level of the monster, or chest, or breakable, etc., dropping it, which is based on level of the dungeon area. Elite, champion, boss, monsters typically grant bonus to eye level. So in Diablo 2, you don't even see an eye level stat on your items. So what is it good for? Eye level is one of the primary factors in determining what type of items drop, i.e. you're getting a scale mail or an archon plate, and along with these base type, it factors into what sort of affix can appear for magic and rare items, or if it's set or unique items, which exact one it will be. 
In Diablo 2, it doesn't determine the level requirements to equip, the damage, the defense, the cost, etc. And the thesis of this post is that in the vast majority of cases, it shouldn't. Um, and this is honestly a big mistake I think that a lot of games are making these days is they are tying together the power level of the item to the item level of the item. And I think that is one of the biggest mistakes, honestly, that any game could make. Um, and as you can see, they agree with me. Um, doing so is a common mistake, is lazy design, and can very much ruin itemization, and it does so on multiple facets. Um, and what do they mean by multiple facets? Well, they're talking about, number one, it completely ruins large amounts of items within the game. You can't find an item at a low level and still use it as a high-level character. And this is a bad thing because then you're basically throwing away everything that the character finds up until the point where they actually start finding items which are considered end-game pieces of equipment. But that's not how Diablo 2 works. Diablo 2's itemization is hailed as one of the best itemizations that has ever existed because literally you have items that are baby items that you can find at relatively low levels that are still used at high levels because those items are still just as good later on in the game. Yes, other items do still come into play as you level up and you find higher level and better items that you can potentially replace those with, but it's not about just simply finding a more powerful version of an item. And it's more so about literally what is best for my character, which I think is the better way to approach things. When you deal with a situation where you have two weapons and one is clearly superior stat-wise to the other, but this weapon just has terrible damage because it's a lower eye level, then you're in a bad itemization situation. You should never be in a situation where you have a clearly superior weapon that is chosen not because... Well, sorry. They, where you have a clearly superior weapon that is not chosen just simply because the other item has a higher item level. Um, let's see, let's move on. So, for example, let's imagine we're lazy designers and we don't want to create 12 different daggers for our game. Why not just make it so that you can find a level 1 dagger and a level 2 dagger and a level 10 dagger all the way up to a level 100 dagger, then you define a curve for your base damage and each level of dagger does incrementally more damage than the previous level. Sound familiar? Simple, right? The same logic can apply to affixes, uniques, etc. Other than the obvious concern that it's a flat and boring and trivializes the rich history of small blades that were created by all sorts of different cultures for all sorts of different purposes throughout history, it also kills your item game in a far more insidious fashion. Let's say I'm happily playing through some random game that isn't Diablo 2, and I'm fighting some boss named Plinklefart on demonic difficulty, and I kill the bugger, and ding, a unique golden Krepesh drops. And this isn't my first rodeo, and I'm super jazzed. I know it's going to be a Griff's Annihilator. Right? Griff's Annihilator is the unique Krepesh. And those are super rare until I remember that this isn't Diablo 2. And Plinklefart is only level 87, and Griff's Annihilator is only valuable if it drops from a level 100 monster. Because let's face it, in this game, all the best items are level 100 because it scales based on eye level. Kind of a letdown, right? So now you're in a situation where you find the very item that you're excited to get. But because the item's eye level scales based on the level of the monster and the monster's level was too low, the Griff's Annihilator that you find ends up being a piece of crap that you would never put on. Um, it gets even worse. Everything scales based on my level. Because I'm only level 75 right now, and what's the point? Nothing I find has any chance of being truly good. Sound familiar to Diablo 4? How many times have you been playing along at a lower level and all the items that you find are sacred, right? So you're just like, well, what's the point? Why, why bother skimming through these sacred items when I know that the ancestral items are so much better, right? So much better to a degree that all of these sacred items are essentially garbage. So I'm not going to take the time to even bother to sort through these items, to play with these items, to look at them. Because, well, I know that ancestral items are just clearly superior, right? So I'm going to be looking for those ancestral items. I'm going to wait for those ancestral items. Um, and even then, in the, even in the ancestral deal, I'm going to look for the higher ancestral items so, so I can get the better stats, right? So, so you've, you've made a situation where 
the person knows that there's no point in actually farming or looking at any of the equipment because they know that none of it is worth using until they hit the higher level, right? And that's exactly the way that it currently works in Diablo 4. As a level 1 character, all the way up to World Tier 4, which starts at level 60, in Ancestral Equipment, you literally know, without a shadow of a doubt, that everything that you find, for the most part, from the beginning to 60, is not worth hanging on to. Now, the aspects themselves, some of them are worth hanging on to before that. So if you find a decent aspect, you can hold on to that aspect, remove it, and then apply it to an ancestral piece of equipment later. But some of the aspects also scale via eye level, like, for instance, the raw damage aspects. And so if you find a raw damage aspect at, say, level 50, it's completely useless because you have to find the raw ad ad damage aspect at a much higher level to actually get good use out of it. Um, and, and it applies to just about everything that works in Diablo 4 this way. Um, so you end up with this situation, which please, let's just get this part of the game over with. And that's also why the answer to the conundrum isn't just get to level 100. That's the end game. And that's all that matters. Because the game is in the details. It's in the journey and everything matters. And if level 1 to 99 don't matter, then why have them at all? The pressure from players will be cut be to cut that part of the game out or at least make it as short as possible and at that point you've spent 90 percent of your development effort on building a part of the game that no one wants to play for very long diablo 4 is like the epitome of this at the current point in time anybody who is anybody plays the game skips past basically the entirety of world tier 1 and world tier 2 um, and tries their best to skip past World Tier 3 as well. And, and the reason is, is because they know, just like I know, that nothing that they find in World Tier 1, 2, or 3, pretty much, for the most part, like like 99% of the stuff that you find in World Tier 1, 2, and 3, they know is useless. They know that spending time there, that languishing there, in this place where everything is useless, is not good. It's not coherent to making a character and building it up. Why spend any time there at all when they know that nothing that they do there is worthwhile, right? So we end up in this situation, which is where the pressure from the players will be to cut that part of the game out, or at least make it as short as possible. You guys might be wondering, when you watch me sometimes, when I make a new character, why don't I play through the character the whole way through? This is why. Because when you play a new character, the game really doesn't start until you hit level 60 and you start putting on ancestral equipment. That's when the game starts. So in this particular case, they've made a situation where nobody wants to play the previous 40 levels or 60 levels, right? So nobody wants to play from 1 to 60. They want to get to 60. They want to start gearing up their character and start working on it toward the end goal. Um, and this is because none of the items matter previously, right? Uh, wait, what if it's, it's a big open world game if the areas don't scale to my level? Doesn't it mean that a lot of the areas become unimportant in the end game? Uh, yes, also true. But as it is, I don't think the solution is just to go around scaling everything everywhere all at once. There's more than one way to skin the cat, what Cisco came up with that idiot. Cisco came up with that idiom anyway, and why do I know it? Um, so our philosophy is not to do any of the above. We're going to have a different items with defined stats. Not every base dagger will be the same. Some will be longer than others. Some will be faster. Maybe some daggers will have better armor penetration, and others might do cold damage. What dagger do you want? It depends on your build. Look for the base type that does what you want and craft it into it. Something good. Happy gaming and have fun. So basically, this is this is a kind of a short little post. Um, uh, if you guys haven't checked this stuff out on the Moon Beast uh, forums or the Reddit, uh, this one is specifically by I believe that's Phil. Um, and um, the thing is, is that they go over the basics, right? But let's talk about why Diablo 2's itemization is good, why it started to fail why Diablo 3's itemization failed, um, and so forth and so on. There's a lot of stuff that we can potentially talk about. Um, let's go ahead and answer some of these other questions that I've got here, since we've finally kind of defined what itemization is, um, which is, what makes good itemization? All right, so that's our first question. How do you, how do you create a itemization which is good, 
across the entire game so that as the players level up, they feel more comfortable with, you know, what's going on. Well, taking Diablo 2 as an example, which has probably one of the best itemizations in the entire industry, um, we can just pull up a random character. Let's, um, let's pull up the Godzilla. Why not? So let's take a look at Godzilla's equipment, and we'll just get an idea of what's going on with him. Um, he's currently using a level 54 Crescent Moon Rune Word, which not a particularly high-level item, right? I mean, at level 54, you've barely completed half the game, uh, but this is an item which is available to him at the end game and is still useful even as a higher-level character. Um, he's currently using a principal armor, which is a relatively crappy piece of equipment, but for his specific build and the way that he's set up, it's actually one of the best pieces of equipment that he can put on because it fires off the holy bolts on striking. This is itemization in a nutshell, is that you have an item which might not necessarily be useful to all characters, but does have its little niche uses within the game. There's several different forms of itemization. One is a item which is open to everyone, like Crescent Moon. Crescent Moon is useful across every single class basically and uh, I've, I've made builds with it on barbarians uh, you can use it for your lightning sorceresses your nova sorceresses you can use it on your trap assassins and your on your holy shock paladins uh, your dream paladins all sorts of various things it honestly works surprisingly well on lots of characters that has anything to do with lightning and um, just a very well crafted piece of equipment all around um, it's powerful but it's also specific to the lightning element, so it tends to only get utilized by characters who are building into the lightning element. Um, similarly, we have a niche but open item, and what do I mean by niche? Well, this is a paladin piece of equipment. Um, it is made for paladins. The skill itself is a paladin skill, and only the paladin can really get good use out of this. But it's not limited to any one specific ability. You could, of course, use zeal. You could use vengeance. You could use charge. You could use all sorts of things with this, depending on how you want to set the character up. Uh, but how you get the most effect out of it is, of course, going to be different. Um, gore riders are a pair of boots that are only level 47 and yet happen to be one of the best pieces of equipment in the game. Imagine if you found a pair of gore riders on Diablo 4. I know they don't exist in Diablo 4, but let's pretend that Gore Riders were the best piece of uh, boots, the best boots that you could wear, like bar none, on pretty much every melee character, right? But imagine you found it at level 50, and the Gore Riders that you found at level 50 weren't worth using. The stats were too low, and, um, and they just weren't really worth putting on. And you'd have to wait until you found a pair of Gore Riders at, say, level 100, because that's the only time when you're going to get a pair of Gore Riders that has the appropriately high level of stats, right? That's the silliness that goes on here, and that's the silliness that doesn't go on in Diablo 2. When you find a pair of Gore Riders, doesn't matter what level you find the pair of Gore Riders at, Gore Riders are good. They're good no matter what level you find them at. Uh, things like String of Ears, it's level 29. You find this really early on in the game, and honestly, it's still one of the best pieces of equipment in the game. This is the kind of itemization that is absolutely amazing. Um, just about every single classification of item in Diablo 2 has some value. Magical items, magical uh, frickin' charms, um, white bases has a very high value. So when you find yourself an extremely good white base, like a cryptic axe, an ethereal cryptic axe for a mercenary, or you find a 15% enhanced mage plate, or a 15% enhanced archon plate, and so forth and so on, even rare items can have surprisingly good value, uh, depending on the slot and what's going on with those particular rare items. Um, I have, I'm sure, a bunch of crap in here. Like, for instance, this little rare dude diddy right here is absolutely insane with the ethereal repairs durability 172% enhanced with only a level 48 requirement. has 236 damage at level 48. I use this on my low-level characters to just absolutely annihilate. One of the things that's the most important when it comes to items, or itemization in general, is the freedom to be able to use those items on just about any character or any build that you would want to use those items on. Gore Riders isn't limited to Paladin. It's not limited to Barbarian. It's not limited to Necromancer. You can use it on any character. There are items in the game that do have those limitations, and things like Paladin-only shields, 
um, you know, there's specific paladin, you know, like uh, assassin only claws and so forth and so on. And, and in general, when you look at a game like this, what you're going to see is you're going to see that the majority of the items, um, and, and we could actually write this down, the majority of the items are open ended. And the reason why this is so important is because it, you want this creativity to be allowed. So for, for people to just be able to like reach into a bucket of Legos and just create whatever they want. Um, you know, you give somebody some paints or some pencils and they draw, and what do they draw? It changes from person to person, right? One person might draw a castle, one person might draw a house and a little kid and a little balloon in his hand. Another person might draw, uh, you know, a, a dinosaur. Another person might draw a cat uh, or a dog. Like, it doesn't really matter because the point is is that you gave them the tools to create what they needed. And in doing so, you made a system where they could go through the process of actually creating what they wanted, right? And and for this reason, let's talk about some good itemization in Diablo 3. Um, so this is Diablo 3, and in Diablo 3, there's actually this one particular set. Uh, there is a lot of bad itemization in Diablo 3, but this particular set is probably one of the better itemizations that they ever created, and uh, it's called the Litany of the Undaunted. It's a very simple set bonus. It says, while this set is your only set item bonus, ancient items you have equipped increase your damage dealt by 750% and reduce your damage taken by 4%. And so what this does is it opens up this huge cacophony of different abilities, skills, uh, characters, all sorts of crazy things that you could potentially do. However, when they created this, they also created items like this, which completely kind of made this obsolete. There are very few builds using this that can compete with something like this. 14,000% uh, increased damage and 60% damage reduction for 10 seconds. Things like this in Diablo 3 ruined things like this. Um, I mean, just taking one look at a character that's using a complete set, how many pieces of equipment are actually open for you to, you know, choose what you want, right? You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out of 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So eight pieces out of 13 have been decided for you. Your skill has been decided for you. Like, what abilities you use have been decided for you. As soon as you put that set on, you basically kind of just give up any kind of freedom of choice that you have in how you want to play your character. Uh, whereas this set, and because we're talking about good itemization, this set allows you that freedom. So it allows you to create a character basically however you want, as long as you can find those ancient items, which is a little bit difficult, mind you. Um, I've done a lot of playing around with the Litany of the Undaunted, uh, the, the Legacy of Nightmares set, and honestly, um, they eventually converted this into a gem as well, which was a good move on their part. Um, and it, the real issue with this comes down to something else entirely, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. The sisterhood um, so what's next here? We've got... Um, Examples of good itemization. Uh, what makes bad itemization, right? So what, what makes an itemization just absolutely terrible? Well, have you ever been going along um, and you find an item, uh, one specific item? Let's see if I can find something in here that might work, but uh, probably not. Okay, let's use, let's use Razor Tail. Uh, razor tail is not really an example of bad itemization, but it's it's close enough to what I'm talking about that we could you know we could we could use it as an example. All right, so let's say you're killing monsters, you know, hoo, 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 and you pick up this belt, um, you identify it, boom, and you look at it, and you're like, 33% piercing attack. Uh, you look up what piercing attack does, you realize that it has to do with bows, um, and you immediately say to yourself, well, I'm not a bow character. Like, I don't use bows. And now this item has lost all value to you. You have no intention of ever using bows. You have no intention of ever putting a bow on any of your character or creating any characters that use bows. Amazons are completely out of your mind. You have no intention of utilizing the demon machine crossbow on a sorceress. You've now given this person an item that they have absolutely no intention of using, no intention of, of you know, putting to any kind of usefulness, right? Well... It's not a bad item. It's useful to all bow characters, right? It's a niche within the game 
The niche is a relatively large niche because any character that uses a bow or any kind of throwing item at all, like Barbarian or Javelins on the Amazon and so forth and so on, could potentially get good use out of this. But as a character that uses a sword and a shield, the item is useless to me, right? Well, it's open-ended enough that Razor Tail is considered good itemization. However, when you look at items mm, like, and uh, let's pull up a, uh, a second game here. I believe we can run both of these games at the same time. Let's go to item uh, Diablo 4, and let's look at itemization in Diablo 4. And we're going to get a better idea of some of the items that potentially kind of tie way too closely to a specific skill. All right, so let's go to the Necromancer. Um, and let's take a look at one of the new uniques that was put out recently. So Di uh, Diablo 4 put out a unique item that uh, is specific to Bloodlance. It's called the Mutilator Plate. Uh, the Mutilator Plate is a really interesting little item. Um, it does have some really nice bonuses for Bloodlance. But let's talk about why I feel like this is bad itemization. So the Mutilator Plate gives you, when you are Bloodlanced, uh, or you are Bloodlanced, and when your Bloodlanced would deal damage to you, it instead fortifies you in your maximum life, and of course, you also get a 5% chance to spawn a Blood Lore Orb, and Bloodlance, of course, deals increased damage. So this particular item is not only specifically for the Necromancer, which push it, puts it within one niche, it is the class-only niche, right? It is also specifically only for one skill on the Necromancer. So out of all of the abilities that the Necromancer has, out of the entire Paragon board that the Necromancer is capable of putting points into, the only thing that this Mutilator Plate is good for is Bloodlance, right? So this becomes an item that when you find it, if you're not utilizing that particular skill, if you're not playing that particular class, if you're not utilizing specifically Bloodlance, the item becomes garbage. So it's one of those things that you have to think about in terms of itemization. Now, having items like this is not necessarily a bad thing if it is a small subset of pieces of equipment. Um, Diablo 2 has it. Diablo... 3 has it, Diablo 4 has it, they all have it to a degree. Uh, Diablo 2 has it less than other games. There are much fewer class-only items than there are non-class items. Um, and even some of the class-only pieces of equipment are still utilizable by other characters. Um, like, for instance, if we were to take a look at some very specific pack class pieces of equipment, and you might be saying, but Ginger, no, no Diablo 2's itemization is absolutely amazing. But the fact of the matter is, is that Diablo 2 also has some items which are itemized very poorly. Um, let's take a look at unique swords as an example um, in Diablo 2. And uh, one of the unique swords that I can tell you right off the bat that has been itemized very poorly is and the item known as Plaguebearer. Plaguebearer has one use and basically one use only, and that is for its plus five points to rabies. It's not a particularly very good sword. It's not particularly fast. Um, it doesn't have large amounts of plus to skills. It doesn't have pretty much anything that anybody would want with the exception of 300 poison damage um, and a 5% chance to cast Poison Nova. Um, overall, it is balanced around dru Druid Rabies only. So what have we done here? It's the same exact thing that we have going on here with the Mutilator Plate. The Mutilator Plate is a item that is specific to one character, the Necromancer, and is specific to one skill, which is Bloodlance. However, Pl Plague Bearer, which is very similar, is specific only to Druid and is specific only to the Rabies skill. It is made specifically for the Rabies Druid and really has no other purpose otherwise, which means that even if you are a Druid and you find the Plague Bearer, you are probably just going to throw it away. Because if you're not interested in rabies, if you have no intention of building a rabies druid, you're going to take that item and you're going to throw it in the trash. We'll all sell it to Charcy one way or the other. 
Um, in fact, swords generally aren't worth even worth picking up for the most part, sale-wise. Although plus five rabies might make it actually worth 35k. But it, honestly, when it comes to this particular item, a lot of times it just stays in the dirt. Um, and the reason why it stays in the dirt is because nobody wants it. Nobody wants to use this. Even the rabies druid himself doesn't necessarily want to use it. Because it's okay. I mean, there's other better options that you can use. And it does actually come in handy as like a swap to, to cast very high rabies, and then to swap back to something like, say, um, a really nice negative resistance item. There's quite a few of them. You can use Plague, you could use the, the freaking Necro Wand. There's a bunch of different options. But in general, this basically just ends up as garbage because it's way too close-ended on how it's created. Now, in Diablo 4, there's also items that are open-ended. A good example of an open-ended item is something like the Pain Gorger Gauntlets or the Fist of Fate. We've got Fists of Fate, which have a very nice open-ended effect of 300% of their normal damage, which basically makes it so that anybody can take good effect of this. The Frost Burns um, are very nicely uh, made. Pain Gorgers uh, Gauntlets are very nicely itemized. Uh, these are open to every single class. Every single class has... Uh, five, was five skills, five basic skills, right? So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. There's like, what? F uh, necromancer, druid, you know, rogue, um, etc., right? So every single class has five basic skills, and every single class can potentially get good use out of Pain Gorger's Gauntlets. It's an open-ended item that is useful to every single character and every single class and just about every single build, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, being able to hit all of the monsters with your basic skill is certainly not a terrible thing. Um, and building around this particular item can be very fun, right? Um, unsung hair aesthetic wraps. Um, again, another example of bad itemization. Uh, this is an item which, again, is tied specifically to the druid and then is tied specifically to the Lightning Storm ability. So, again, it's very similar to the Mutilator Plate. We have an item which only one class in the game can utilize, and then on top of that, we have an item that only one build, basically one actual skill, can actually utilize. So if you're not using Lightning Storm, you would never put this pair of gloves on, ever. Right? So if you're a druid who has no intention of ever being a Lightning Storm druid, and because you can't trade these items, then when you find them, you're pretty much just going to throw them away or just deconstruct them or sell them or whatever it is. You might not even pick them up, depending on the you know current gold situation and material situation. You might not even bother taking them back to town to destroy them if you're full up on materials and whatnot. Because there's no, there's no reason to take these back. You, you have no intention of ever using them. And this is kind of where things get kind of uh, strange. Because when you see a pair of Fists of Fate, like a really nice Fists of Fate, when you see a really nice Pain Gorgers, when you see a really nice Frost Burns, uh, which I don't know if I have some Frosties in here. I, I know I, I'm using Frosties on at least one of my characters right now. Um, but when you see these really nice items, you more likely than not pick them up, compare them, check and see which ones are the most powerful, and hang on to the most powerful versions. And, and the reason why you do this is because... They're useful to everyone, right? It just depends on whether or not your build could take advantage of them. Or not even whether your build can take advantage of them, but whether you can make your build take advantage of them, right? So you hang on to them. These, on the other hand, don't have the same good graces. Um, and it's not necessarily that these items are terrible and shouldn't be added into the game, but that the ratio should be much closer or much, uh, much fewer of these than the others, right? If, if we write it down on a, on a you know, like a, a thing, I know I talked about this earlier, but when I said the majority of the items should be open-ended, right? Well, what's the ratio of that? Like, what are we talking about ratio-wise in terms of, like, what's the majority? It should probably be around, like, 90 to 10. So 90% open-ended and about 10% close-ended items. Um, this way, you have a much larger database of items which are useful across the board with a few finite items which are only useful to specific characters. And if we take a look at Diablo 2 as an example, Diablo 2 has the same thing going on. So if you go to Diablo 2 um, Class Uniques, right? So let's talk about Class Uniques. And... Um, We've got various things, like we've got Paladin Shields, right? So the Paladin-specific shields 
We've got things like the Target, the Rondash, uh, you know, the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then on top of that, there's also the unique ones. So if we go into the unique shields, you know, there's specific unique shields like the Alba Negra, the Herald of Zakarum. Um, you know, you've got things that are for specific classes. Each class has their own specific items in Diablo 2. Like, there are specific Amazon-only bows and spears. There's uh, assassin-only claws. There's sorceress-only orbs. There's barbarian-only helmets, druid-only pelts, necromancer-only shrunken heads, and so forth and so on. But the majority of the items in Diablo 2 still are on the everybody-can-use-it side of things. Even class-only items. There's a lot of class-only items that are technically made for those respective classes that still are open-ended and allow other people to use them. Um, one good example is things like the wands. Um, there is the doo -doo 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 necromancer wands, which are obviously uh, set up for the necromancer, right? Um, and if we take a look at the unique wands in Diablo 2, what you have is you have a large number of wands that are set up specifically for the necromancer. They have necromancer-only skills. Um, but when it comes to specific wands, like, as an example, Death's Web, which has a relatively high amount of negative poison resistance, this becomes useful to everybody. It's not just one particular person. It's any character that uses poison damage, rabies druids, Necromancer, Poison Necromancers. You can also utilize it with um, basically uh, Javelin, Poison Javelin uh, Amazons by using the Swap 2 method. Um, and it becomes a very, very powerful item for anybody who's trying to get negative poison resistance in their build. Um, in fact, negative 50% poison resistance is so effective that utilizing this on like a Rabies Druid is absolutely insane. Despite the fact that it was very clearly made for the Necromancer with the plus one to two poison and bone spells, um, as well as the negative 50% poison resistance, you can tell that it was made for a poison over Necromancer, but at the same time it's still open-ended to be used on other characters. Something like the uh, Maelstrom U wand is a fun little one to find early on in the game because it's only level 14 requirement, and it has 30% faster cast with some decent resistances. So you throw this on a low-level sorceress while you're waiting for your spirit, and now you have an item that can help you cast faster and give you a little bit of lightning resistance in the process, which is kind of a pain in the butt. And it's this kind of crazy itemization that makes Diablo's itemization so amazing. Now, I talked earlier about Diablo 2's itemization being ruined by certain things. Um, and very similarly to other games, Diablo 2's itemization did kind of get stunted by the addition of rune words that overpowered everything else. Um, and this is kind of uh, an oddity that needs to be talked about in the Diablo 2 world because a lot of people see it as a good thing because these items are powerful. But what they also don't understand is that when you introduce an item that's extremely powerful, it then just simply removes all the other pieces of equipment from the table. Um, let me see if I can explain this in a way that, uh, that makes sense. So in Diablo 4, um, when you find a, you know, a pair of Fists of Fate, um, if you find them at a high enough level uh, or item power, right, then they're worth using. Okay, but if I find a Fist of Fate that is level, uh, you know, 55, or, uh, you know, I found it at level 55 from a 55 monster, then the item power of the item might be too low to actually be useful. In this way, the higher eye level Fists of Fate will actually completely overpower all of the items previous that dropped at any power level below what was the maximum amount, right? So what I've done here is I've made an item which basically invalidates all other pieces of equipment before it, right? It's so powerful that it makes all the other pieces of equipment useless by comparison. Well, Diablo 2 did the same thing. Um, when Grief was introduced, when Enigma was introduced, things like that, they basically made any piece of equipment that you would put in those slots for those respective builds just look absolutely terrible by comparison. So, which is one of the reasons why you see so many people using Enigma, and one of the reasons why you see so many people using Grief, is because th the itemization was there before they were created. And all of these items in the game had usefulness and value 
before they added grief and before they added enigma but then once they added grief and once they added enigma into diablo 2 all of those previous items got compared to the new item that was added and were basically made invalid as a result now grief isn't the best item for every single build if you're doing like a vengeance paladin or uh, you're doing like a blade fury assassin there's tons of different way uh, things that grief doesn't work for but for what it does work for physical damage abilities it tends to be the best option and same thing with enigma because enigma has so many good stats on it it's not just the repel teleport it's the plus the skills it's the the freaking uh, magic find i mean it's the huge amount of strength that they put on the item it's just an absolutely insane piece of equipment that makes a lot of other pieces of equipment just look terrible by comparison and that's kind of what you want to avoid in video games you don't want to create a situation where you've made all of these things, right? I mean, if, if I just, just take a look, like, in my stash, and we've got all of these uniques, right? If, if I came out tomorrow with a new classification of uniques, say, I don't know, let's call it um, uh, Celestial, right? So tomorrow, Diablo 4 releases the Celestial Equipment. And the Celestial Equipment goes up to item power 1,200. And, and Celestial Equipment is so much better than all Ancestral Equipment, right? Then everything that I have in my stash right now, everything. I'm not talking about just these. Everything I have in my stash, the item power would be too low. They're all Ancestral items. They, they can't compete with the new items, right? So because they can't compete with the new items, because the new items are so much more powerful than the old ones, then these are basically all garbage. I just basically throw these all away. And that's kind of what happens in Diablo 2 and in Diablo 3 and in Diablo 4 when you add a new piece of equipment that is so much more powerful than the others, right? You, you now basically just invalidate all the other pieces of equipment. And now you're going to have to go regrind out all of your gear in the new Celestial uh, equipment, right? Or in World of Warcraft, when they increase the item power of your equipment, you've got to go grind out new item power equipment for all of your pieces of equipment. No matter what you're wearing, right? You could be wearing, like, the, the literally the best raid equipment that existed prior to the patch where they upped the item power. And you're ridiculously hard to get raid equipment that took you, like... A month of farming to, to you know fully deck out your character rate equipment is now completely useless because they increased the item power cap right and um, it's not necessarily different from Diablo 2 introducing an item which is just so much more powerful than all the others all right so if we go back to the list here um, let's go down to, because we, we've talked about good itemization, we've talked about bad itemization, we've given examples of both. Um, I've given examples of bad itemization for Diablo 4, good itemization for Diablo 4, uh, bad examples of, um, or, uh, examples of bad itemization in Diablo 3, um, and examples of good itemization in Diablo 3. Um, and then we've also talked about um, examples of good itemization and bad itemization in Diablo 2. And what it comes down to is that good itemization generally revolves around making an item worth something, first off, right? So let's, let's write this down here. So um, worth something no matter what level it is. Um, this is, I think, something that Diablo 2 did very well. Um, and it's something that Diablo 3 and Diablo 4 did not pull off very well. Um, and this is basically that it allows you to have an item, like, for instance, Mage Fists um, or a Stone Ring of Jordan or, um, or any other number of various items, that when you find them, you find them at a specific level, right, in a specific place, but that does not invalidate the item from being useful later on in the game, right? So you have items like Haas, you have items like Mage Fists, um, you have items like, um, you know, like Griffin's Idea Dim, and uh, no matter what level you are, uh, these items can still potentially be useful no matter what, right? So they are transcendent across the borders of the game, whether you find them in normal, nightmare, or hell difficulty, whether you find them at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, or 99, it doesn't matter when you find them or where you find them, they're still always going to be useful within the paradigm of building characters. Right? And then bad itemization is basically where you restrict 
items too heavily to specific borders, niches. I don't know how to spell niche. Uh, <laughs> let's say classes, um, skills, uh, also eye level, making eye level extremely important in a lot of cases, can invalidate large swaths of pieces of equipment. Um, and in this way, you basically are restricting the item far too much. Or another way that you can have bad itemization is making one item more powerful than all the rest, um, which basically invalidates every single item within the game by making that item the clear tr winner, the clear choice over every other choice that you could potentially put in that slot, right? Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is what is personal agency. So personal agency is something that's very important to games. Um, it, it is something that the developers, the Diablo 4 developers, have talked about. Um, specifically, um, during the launch of the game, they talked about how they had set up Diablo 4 so that it would be more uh, open to how you want to build your character, like what you want to create, right? So personal agency is, and, and we can actually look this up, right? So let's, let's just talk about personal agency as a, ter a term. So if we type personal agency into uh, Google... Um, you'll see that it says personal agency refers to the sense that I am the one who is causing or generating an action. Um, a person with a sense of personal agency perceives himself as the subject influencing his or her own actions and life circumstances. Now, why is this so important in video games? Well, nobody likes to feel like every single choice has already been made for them. Uh, nobody likes to feel like every single build and every single, uh, you know, skill and every single character that they could create is just the product of a developer's mind, right? So let, let's let's talk about this in a way that makes sense. And, um, and I'm going to bring this up a little bit. And we're going to talk about the different ways that you can potentially make a game. Uh, and this is pertinent to Diablo 4. It's pertinent to Diablo 2. It's, uh, it's pertinent to a lot of games. So when you create a game, um, there are a couple different ways that you could potentially go about it. There's actually, there's actually mainly just three. Uh, there's the three ways. Um, and the three ways of making video games usually revolve around, around this. Uh, number one is plan everything out to the T. Um, now, what does that mean exactly, right? Well, basically, when you create a game, you can go through the process of controlling every single aspect of every single character, of every single skill, and you can make it so that every choice, and we can write that here, every choice that a player could ever make has already been created, designed, and tested by the developer. In other words, think about this like um, uh, you will fate, right? Fate would be a, a good example. Uh, some people who believe in fate believe that fate governs all of our actions. So if we type in what is uh, what is fate? That's a that's a good uh, that's a good option here. Um, so fate is the development of events beyond a person's control regarded as determined by a supernatural power. In this particular case, the supernatural power would be the developer. The developer is the supernatural power. And we would be the person under control of the developer's supernatural power. And the reason for this is because the developer created every single choice and every single option that we have available to us. And basically all we're doing is choosing from a predetermined set of options that the developer has already created for us, right? And this is the very definition of the first way that video games can be created. And when you create a video game in this way, players tend to actually not like this way. Um, Diablo 3 was very heavy on this. Um, set items in Diablo 3, and we can talk about that. Set items in Diablo 3 fall into this category. Um, this is basically the predetermined path. 
Um, and the predetermined path involves things like this, uh, which is basically where you have an item that tells you um, to use Reign of Vengeance, that you get a, when you spend a hatred sp a generating attack or a hatred spending attack, right? So you basically reduce the cooldown of your Reign of Vengeance, so use Reign of Vengeance. Reign of Vengeance deals 100% increased damage, so use Reign of Vengeance. After casting Reign of Vengeance, deal 14,000% increased damage and take 60% reduced damage for 10 seconds. So this set is literally telling you, use Reign of Vengeance no matter what. If you don't, well then you're not going to get the bonuses that we're offering you, right? So this is telling you what button to push and how often to push it. Um, and it's telling you which one that you need to use in between, right? So it says reduce the cooldown of Reign of Vengeance for four seconds when you hit with a hatred generating or hatred spending attack. So you've got to spam your hatred generating and hatred spending attacks to reduce the cooldown of Reign of Vengeance. And you need to spam Reign of Vengeance because if you don't spam Reign of Vengeance, you're not going to get your damage bonus and you won't get your damage reduction. So you won't be able to kill anything unless you spam Reign of Vengeance and you won't be able to survive if you don't spam Reign of Vengeance. So they literally give you the exact order in which you need to do things which is spam your hatred generators and hatred spenders and spam rain of vengeance every time the cooldown is up so that you can maintain your 60 percent damage reduction and your 14,000 percent increased damage yes 14,000 percent increased damage many of the sets in diablo 3 were like this they're predetermined paths that tell you everything that you need to do this is probably one of the more extreme examples now one way that this tends to fail is that people see that there's no actual choice um, this is kind of like an oddity and it must have to do honestly with the, the intelligence of the human mind is that eventually we are able uh, we as humans are able to see the underlying predetermination um, realizing that basically no choice we make matters. Um, and and I think a lot of players when they play games like this that are in, in the field number one tend to understand relatively quickly. It doesn't really take very long before they start to understand that basically no build they make and no no character that they design is really truly their own and that it's basically all been predetermined by the developers in advance um, and n there's no creativity there's no invention right you're just you're inside of a puzzle box that was created by a developer just running through the motions um, rule number uh, way number two that you can potentially do things is the ridiculously chaotic system of we don't care what you do or you could call this free will free will the free will systems don't work either um, because there's no structure to the system whatsoever um, what happens is is you end up with a system where nothing really matters at all because the developers didn't have any plan right this system is much more akin to giving a child crayons and seeing what they draw. There's really no telling what the kid is going to draw. Um, you basically just gave them the tools to create what they wanted to create, and the creativity of the person is really all that's there. Like, it's, it's not... It's not really going to matter what the person draws. The developers don't care what the kid draws. They're just going to let it go, right? They're just going to let the kid be creative. Now, option number two has the most personal agency out of anything. But the problem with this system is that making a, a system like this where you have no clue what the hell's going on, where you don't really care what's being done, leads to... Um, chaos. That's basically what I'll call it. Um, it's just pure chaos. Um, is it a good system? Maybe. Is it a terrible system? Maybe. Is it a bland system? Maybe. Like, you don't really know what's happening within this system until you just set the people free into the system and see what comes out the other end. And a lot of the times this system fails 
Um, and the reason why it fails is because the chaos leads to a bad result. Um, it, let, let me uh, kind of like simplify this in a way that would make a lot of sense. Let's say you take a bunch of dogs and you just throw them in the room together, right? You don't know these, if these dogs get along with each other. You don't know whether they're going to be friends. You don't know whether they're going to be enemies. You don't know whether they're going to uh, be relatively indifferent and not care what's going on, right? So you leave them in the room together, and, you know, like, you come back an hour later, and, you know, maybe they're all friends, and they're snuggling on the, on the carpet together. You know, good result. Maybe um, one of them decided he didn't like another one, killed him, literally ripped him open right there in the middle of the, the hallway, blood everywhere, and you come in, and there's just chaos all over the place. Blood, dogs eating other dogs, craziness, right? Bad result. Maybe uh, all the dogs get together and just tear up all the furniture. Like, you don't know exactly what's going to happen because you didn't really make any kind of structure, any kind of system to try and guide what's going on. Where in plan number one, you determined everything in advance, okay? You determined all of the stuff that you could possibly determine, and then this, in turn, led to the predetermined path problem, which is where the players don't really feel like they have any control over what's going on. In path number two, the ridiculously chaotic system, nobody cares what's going on. The developers don't care, right? It's complete free will. It's complete chaos. And because when you do this, you end up with more often than not a bad result, this is also an issue, uh, which leads to number three, which tends to be the best system. So number three, uh, which is the best system, is the guided chaos. Guided chaos is probably, in terms of itemization, the best way that you can possibly do things. And it is, in my opinion, the one that works the best to allow for personal agency without resulting in chaos. And so what, what is guided chaos, basically? Guided chaos is where you create a rough outline of a system with some predetermined paths, um, but a lot of unpredetermined paths. to allow for personal agency. Um, now, what does this do exactly? Well, it's going to create a situation where the unknown is going to occur. So, uh, to, to put this from the developer's point of view, um, in this scenario, the developer doesn't really know what's going to happen. Um, and, and this is kind of a, a good thing. It's a good thing. However, the developer is still there to help guide the game in the right direction. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, let's say player X... Um, discovers an exploit, right? Um, everybody catches on to this exploit. And uh, within days, the entire community is using exploit X. The developers can then go through the process of determining, so we would determine whether exploit X is good or bad for the game. All right? Once we determine whether exploit X is good or bad for the game, we take one of two actions. If exploit X is good, perhaps turn it... Or well, not perhaps, sorry. If it's good, turn it into a feature. Right? This is guided chaos. If exploit X is bad fix it. Um, and with way the, the way that this works with the guided chaos method, um, you end up with a system which is fluid and grows with the player base. So as the player base creates new things that the developers have never intended, which has happened in Diablo 4, by the way, 
Um, and it happened in Diablo 2 as well. Um, it, when they make things that have never been intended and the developers go, okay, well, it, you know, let's not just squash it immediately. Let's take a look at it. Let's see if we like it. If we like it, this is something that should be incorporated into the game as a feature. Um, an example of this is the Malignant Rings. So during the season of the Malignant, even though season one was probably one of the worst seasons that's ever been existed in Diablo 4, um, some of the Malignant powers, like the uh, Ring of the Sacrilegious, or the, the sorry, the, the Malignant power that specifically was made into the Ring of Sacrilegious, uh, was something that people really enjoyed, right? Instead of just simply saying, well, you know, we know you guys liked it, but we don't want it in the game at all, right? They're letting the community help grow the game in the direction that is positive, right? So in Diablo 4, I think this is the, the way that they are doing things right now, which is the chaos, the, the guided chaos method. This is the way that Diablo 4 is currently being created. When we come up with a bug or an exploit which is bad for the system, bad for the game in general, they remove it, which is a good thing. We want them to remove bad bugs. When they come out with a uh, you know an exploit or a bug, which is a good thing, they turn it into a feature, which is exactly as it should be. So going forward, as you see Diablo, the Diablo 4 dev team make changes, um, what you're going to notice is that they're trying their best to react to the way that the community is developing, um, which shows you that they're not doing method number one because method number one would mean that everything is predetermined and that we're not surprising them at all, that we come up with nothing that they haven't already thought of, right? That they've already seen every path that we could ever possibly take, and they already know all of the builds that we could ever possibly create. But they've already stated in several of the campfire chats that we had surprised them with some of the ways that we had created characters, some of the builds that we had made, and some of the ways that we had started developing the game, right? And that surprise shows you that they're not doing plan number one because plan number one would completely eliminate that because they would know everything that we're doing. Everything that they had ever planned would be in the game and nothing that we could ever do would surprise them because it would all already be predetermined by their you know, system that they placed in the game. Uh, we also know that they're not doing the ridiculously chaotic system of number two because they have a framework in place for us to use and while it might not be the most ridiculously complicated framework, it is there to guide us in the right direction. And we also know that they actually are paying attention because in this particular case, the, you know, the developers don't have a plan, right? They're just letting us go. Just whatever chaos happens, happens, and they just watch and sit back and see what forms as a result. But that's not the case because they're making adjustments and changes to things as we go forward, right? So when they interfere, right, whether it be whether good or bad interference, however you want to see it, they're not doing plan number two because plan number two would have very little to no interference whatsoever. It would pretty much just be like, you know, just putting a bunch of monkeys in a room and then just watching to see what chaos happens. You know, if they fight to the death or they form a monkey union and take over the universe or, like, it doesn't matter what they do, you're just watching to see what the result is, right? And, and that's basically what number two is. Um, so we know that they're doing the guided chaos method because in Diablo 4, we have a rough system. They're giving us uh, items to see what we do with them, and they're designing certain things and seeing how we react to those designs, right? So they give us an item. We don't like it. They redesign it, right? An example of this is um, something like uh, the Ring of the Starless Skies, uh, which I don't have one on me right this second. But the Ring of the Starless Skies was badly designed. Um, and the Ring of the Starless Skies has been adjusted since then to incorporate the better version, right? Um, things like Storm's Companion, uh, which I think I got a Storm's Companion around here somewhere, or it's probably on my Druid, isn't it? PPD DVDs. Eh, I got so many unique items in here. I hang on to these items because I make videos on them, but I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of the items in here are very poorly made in Diablo 4 because they're so specific to uh, very specific characters and very specific builds. And so a lot of the times if I'm not doing that specific build, if I'm not doing that specific character, 
they just don't get used. It's it's unfortunate. And um, and that's just the way it is because unlike uh, say X Falls or Fist of Fate or Pain Gorgers, um, you know that, that were even flicker steps that have multiple uses. Um, you know items like the Dolmen Stone are only useful to one character in one build. Items like Word of a Con are really only useful to one character in one build. Um, even things like, uh, you know, like Insatiable Fury is really only useful to the Druid and only if you're doing the Werebear. Um, it's just, it's, you, when you really start to, like, break down the uniques in, in this game and in other games, um, you really start to see kind of like where they, they went wrong and where they go, go right. Um, and in Diablo 4, it's not just the uniques, it's also the aspects, right? It's also the the modifiers on the pieces of equipment themselves. Um, and, uh, and of course, we could talk about that as well. But um, let me finish up here first before we go to the next thing. So with these three methods, I think you can clearly see which one kind of has, like, the better half. Um, this one, which is where you learn from the community, and, and we can type that here as well. Uh, the guided chaos learn from the community method honestly seems like the best of the lot. It's basically where you kind of like prune a tree, um, and 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 it, it, that's not it, that's probably the best ex, you know like way that you can explain it. Think about um, you know you have a a tree in the backyard, and maybe it's an apple tree, right? And when the apple tree grows in the wrong direction, when it starts to maybe say touch the power line or grow into the gutter, or uh, maybe, you know, like, it has a rotten tree branch on it. You're going to trim it. You're going to maintain it. Um, you might cut off the rotten tree branch and, and put some sap over top of the hole. Um, you know, you do your best to maintain it. If it gets bugs, um, you're going to uh, maybe even use some pesticides on it or some natural methods, whatever's going on. And you're going to slowly and dutifully take care of this tree until it becomes, you know, a blossoming apple tree that uh, that gives you as many apples as you can freaking hold and probably even sell some more, right? Well, that's basically how the game methodology works, is that you give freedom to the players and the community to help them to create the game that they want, but at the same time, you can't just leave them to themselves and give them unlimited freedom, like in plan number two, because rotten branches will grow, bugs will occur, things will happen that will corrupt the tree and make it nasty, it will make it wrong, essentially, right? So you have to use the guided chaos method, otherwise you end up with problems, right? Um, let's talk about some of the other issues, which is itemization specifically in like what the effects are on the items. Uh, so in Diablo 4, Diablo 4 has a little bit of an issue with this right now, and it has to do with the actual effects on the items being way too complicated. Um, this just in general. Uh, let's pull out some items here, and let's let's kind of talk about this for a minute. So first off, we've got way too many modifiers that have to do with specific damage types. And um, let me see if I can find some good options here to kind of show you what I mean. Of course, I've got about 10 trillion rings and everything else in here. I'm sure I can find what I'm looking for. All right, so here's one right here. This one is uh, damage to stunned enemies. All right, so let's look for some more. Uh, we also have damage over time, right? So damage over time. We have two, 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 uh, damage affected by trap skills. We've got uh, damage to injured enemies. Uh, we've got uh, damage to distant enemies. We've got <laughs> damage to close enemies. Um, we've got uh, damage to crowd-controlled enemies, right? So let's put that next to the stun. So we're going to put the stuns together, right? Uh, we've also got... Um, uh, let's see here. We've got so many different different options here for, for items. Let's see if we can pull out all the stops here. Uh, we've got uh, damage over time. Uh, here we go. We've got damage to shadow. Uh, shadow damage over time affected enemies. So we've got another DOT type. So let's, uh, let's just put all these together. So here we go. We've got damage over time and we've got shadow damage over time. Um, and then we also have... Do, 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 do. 
And that was damage to enemies affected by shadow damage over time. Um, and then we should also have shadow damage, right? So there's shadow damage. Uh, and then we have shadow damage over time, too. There should also be shadow damage over time. Um, basically, what I'm trying to get at here... Oh, here's damage to chilled enemies. Uh, there's another one. So damage to cold, uh, frozen, damage to chilled, damage to stun, damage to slowed. It, it, it gets absolutely crazy. So when you think about modifiers on items, um, we're coming into the same category of the uniques, right? So we talked about this earlier. Um, unsung aesthetic wraps represents a poorly itemized unique because it is more specific to a one skill to one ability on one class, right? Which means that you really just don't get as much usefulness out of this particular item as you do others, right? And items like Fist of Fate, which were useful to everybody, is a much better form of itemization. Well, when you look at an item like Damage Over Time, Damage Over Time affects bleeding, poison, um, shadow damage. You know, it affects anybody who has a Damage Over Time effect, right? But then you look at something like uh, Damage to Shadow Damage Over Time Affected Enemies or damage, shadow damage over time specifically, or bleeding damage over time. Um, what this does is it just isolates all of these modifiers into subcategories and makes them useless to everybody else. So whenever anybody sees a modifier that says damage to shadow damage uh, over time affected enemies, they're immediately going to go, okay, well, if I'm not doing shadow damage, then this is useless, right? Um, and the same thing occurs when it comes to these modifiers like crowd control damage, which is a more broad uh, encompassing one, so 10% damage to crowd controlled enemies, which is going to affect all crowd controls, which if you go into the list and you pull up crowd control damage, um, crowd control damage is a relatively broad term, and of course I can just put this ring on temporarily just to get the effect here. So as you can see here, we've got crowd control now, and crowd control is Slow, immobilize, stun, knock back, knock down, taunt, fear, tether, daze, chill, or freeze. Well, at the current moment, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 different modifiers for crowd control. Um, actually, I think it might be 11 because I don't think there's a tether. But you kind of get what I'm saying is that why do we need. 12 different versions, essentially, and I know it's a little bit less than that, but 12 different versions of crowd control modifiers. Why can't they all just be crowd control damage? Like, why, why do we have to have all of these individual modifiers, like damage to chilled enemies, damage to stunned enemies, damage to, uh, you know, crowd controlled enemies, damage to feared enemies, damage to this, damage to that. It, it, it's just too complicated for no reason. Um, and they really need to dial back all of the craziness when it comes to all of these damage on Tuesdays. And the developers have acknowledged this, by the way. They have acknowledged the fact that damage on Tuesdays type effects is not useful. And it's needlessly complicated for no reason, right? So they've also talked about some of the other things, which is uh, when you pull up a pair of gloves. And let's use gloves as an example because this is a, a really good one. Um, so gloves can have plus the skills, right? They can have plus two lightning storm, or they can have like uh, plus three tornado, or etc. Right? Well, as it is right now, the gloves can literally roll with every single modifier for plus the skills. I have literally found pairs of gloves that will literally say like, uh, you know, plus three blood lance, plus three, um, you know, bone spear, plus three, um, you know, blood. Uh, I'm trying to remember all of the abilities right off the top of my head. Um, you know, plus three blood lance, plus three blood surge, plus three blight, plus three sever. And you look at them and you're like, who, who are these useful to? Like, who, who, who in the world would ever utilize uh, an item that has plus three to all of my core skills um, and nothing else? Like, I mean, when you look at an item, you always want things like critical strike chance, for gloves, you want things like attack speed, uh, all stats, maybe lucky hit chance, whatever it is that you're going for specifically. But you don't necessarily want, pretty much ever, uh, to sacrifice all of those stats for what is essentially worthlessness, right? 
Um, and a lot of the abilities and a lot of the, the way that these things work, like, like distant and close, uh, in my opinion, need to just go away. Um, I don't, I'm not really sure what they were thinking with distant and close. I don't really like distant and close. I think it's needlessly complicated for no reason. Uh, close is superior to distant in almost every way because every single monster wants to clap your booty cheeks at close range. And so for the most part, whenever you're fighting, um, it's very difficult to ever stay in distant modifier. Um, you're almost always in close modifier on pretty much all characters, especially with the way they have the camera zoomed in. Um, you end up in the close modifier like 99% of the time. Um, and then there's modifiers that just nobody's interested in that need to be kind of removed or fixed. Um, this one in particular, so on these gloves, you notice how it says uh, minions inherit 5% of your thorns? They used to have the same thing going on here, like with the, with the 12 different crowd controls. Um, in Diablo um, in Diablo 4, you can have minion thorns, right? Well, they had it set up so that it was split into um, your golem inherits your thorns, your mage inherits your thorns, your skeletal warriors inherits your thorns, and there were literally three different modifiers for setting up thorns for your minions, and it just made it needlessly complicated. And they were like, well, we don't understand why we did this. Like, that was stupid. Let's just fix this. And they took all three modifiers, and they just smooshed them down into one modifier. So now instead of having a modifier for each individual minion, you have a modifier for all of the minions, right? They, they took the needlessly complicated itemization of the items, and they, they squished it down into a much more finite system, right? Um, and and it, honestly, they need to do this across the board, like to a lot of the stuff. The crowd control stuff needs to be squashed down. Um, things like the critical strike damage for multiple characters. Like when you look at critical strike damage, um, just as an example. Um, I, see, I'm, I seem to be missing some critical strike damage on my ring. But um, critical strike damage is a stat that you can get on just about, you know, like your rings, your weapons, um, et cetera, your gloves. I can't remember if you can get it on your gloves, actually. But um, it's, it's a very power, important stat, right? A lot of people like critical strike damage. But then you have critical strike damage with bone skills. You got critical strike damage with, you know, brawling skills. You got critical strike damage with imbued skills. You got critical strike damage with, uh, you know, it, it's shadow skills. It, it, I mean, it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to have, like, 12 different critical strike damage with modifiers. It makes things needlessly complicated just the same way that the monsters and minions inherit thorns is needlessly complicated. Um, now, I understand why you would potentially do it. Um, if you guys are unaware, um, let's take a look at my resource. So, my resource is essence. Right? What is it on the, dru on the barbarian? It's Fury. What is it on the Druid? It's Spirit. What is it on the uh, the uh, Rogue? It's Energy. What is it on the Sorceress? It's Mana. Right? Why is it different between all the characters? The reason why it's different between all the characters is so that you can balance it better. Right? So when it comes to adding resource or taking resource away, or when it comes to items that grant resource in various ways, that you have a method to control whether or not one class gets a huge amount of resources or the other, right? So that you don't have to balance resources across all the characters. Instead, you can balance the resources on each character. Okay, but here's the problem with that. It is a good system if you're trying to keep these systems apart from each other, definitely. But... On top of that, we also have items like Tobolt's Will, um, which give you resource for all of your characters across the board. Um, or you have an item like this, which gives critical strike damage to all characters. So why do we need an additional critical strike damage when we have a already all-encompassing global stat? Throat's getting dry. I've been talking for a while. But it's a fun topic to talk about. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy, you know, talking about this kind of stuff. But therein lies another issue with the way that they have things set up. Is why have a global stat? So, 
why have global stats and class-specific stats? I mean, it doesn't really seem like a whole lot of purpose. If you're going to introduce, say, a stat called resource, uh, which adds 30 resource, or let's say 60 resource, to all characters who put the item on, and then you also have the... It rings will roll energy, they'll roll spirit, they'll roll essence, they'll roll fury, um, etc., etc., right? Well, why have this and this? If you've already set up an all-encompassing resource stat, like, you, there's several items in the game right now that have all resources, right? There's to bolts. Um, there's Melted Heart of Seleg. Um, and I'm trying to remember the rest of them. There's a couple different ones that have all resources on them now. Besides just simply those, and I can't remember the names of every single one of them right off the top of my head. But you guys get my point. This is something that they've established within the game to add large amounts of resource to characters, right? And this is also something that they've established within the game to add resources into the characters. But the problem is, is that, well, why do we need both? Like, I I feel like the items are already so overly complicated in Diablo 4 that you kind of have to sit there with, uh, you know, like a little pen and a pad and a calculator and try and figure out what the hell's going on half the time. Because there's so many damage on Tuesday modifiers. There's so many individual modifiers that have to do with individual stats. And it just doesn't make for fun itemization. I mean, you spend most of your time just simply comparing items together, trying to figure out which one's better than the other, only to be presented with a limited number of choices anyway of potentially good mods on the pieces of equipment. And then you look at the other mods, the ones that are absolutely terrible that nobody wants to actually use, and, I mean, you just, you frown. Like, you, it, it makes it needlessly difficult to actually find the modifiers that you're looking for. Um, <laughs> I don't really know what else to say about this. I feel like I've already said just about everything there is to say. I mean, this is a topic that could go on for, for a very long period of time. Um, I mean, I personally don't like the fact that my weapon governs all of my damage. Um, one of the main things that this causes a problem with, and this is, this is also down to itemization, is that when you find an item that's not a high item power, a weapon that's not a high item power, it immediately becomes garbage, right? So if I find, say for instance, a lower item power weapon, and, and as I go through here, you'll notice that most of the weapons that I have in here are relatively high item power. Um, and the reason why they're relatively high item power is because I throw away or destroy all the ones that aren't. Um, take this Great Staff of the Crone, which is the only one that I've found right now. It's an 856 plus 25. By all standards, this is a piece of garbage. Um, I need something closer to 900 or 925 for it to actually be useful because all of my damage, everything that I do is based off of the item power of this item. Which means that when this item isn't a high item power, it's useless. And unfortunately what they've done by this is they've created a situation where you will find a unique, you'll get excited because you found the unique item, you know, maybe the Great Staff of the Crone drops, you'll find it, you pick it up, and then look at the item power and immediately realize that it's not worth using, right? Because it's way too low item power to be useful. And we're back to the, the you know, at the beginning of this stream when we talked about how you the item power basically makes all other previous items to the item power, which is the considered the highest, right? Um, all of those items are essentially just deleted from the game at that point because they're useless. Nobody wants to use them. Um, it's skip skip to the part that's important. Skip to the part of the game that's actually useful, right? <coughs> um, now, I do want to talk about some positive aspects. So moving in the right direction, right? So is Diablo 4 moving 
in the correct direction? Um, and I feel like the answer to this is yes. I feel like they are starting to understand itemization better, and they are starting to figure out what makes good itemization and what makes bad itemization, and it's slowly starting to take form. Let me explain. So when the game first started, um, they added a lot of items into the game l that were very specific pieces of equipment. Things like Insatiable Fury, uh, Mad Wolf's Glee, which I know I've got a Mad Wolf's Glee in here somewhere, or maybe it's sitting on my... Yeah, Mad Wolf's Glee, uh, which are very specific to specific builds and specific characters. Um, things like Butcher's Cleaver, which really didn't quite turn out as good as I think they hoped. Um, and, uh, you know, like Bloodless Scream, which is very specific to darkness skills. Um, I mean, we could go over hundreds of these items, but, uh, but if we talk about each one of these items uh, by themselves, even Ring of Mendeln, which is very specific, uh, what you're going to find is that a lot of the uniques that were added at the beginning of the game were very, very specific uniques very finite to not only specific characters, but also specific builds within those characters. Um, and this was the bad itemization that we kind of started out with. But then as the game progressed, they started to realize better, like, what kind of items we needed. Fist of Fate was an item that was released in the beginning as well, and it was a pretty big success, as well as Frostburns, uh, which I don't have a pair of Frosties right here. Um, but going off of the original uniques, you start to kind of get an idea, well, they didn't really quite know what they were doing. Um, then they started adding in newer uniques. Um, and the newer uniques that they added in, like Tacits of the Dawning Sky, um, Godslayer's Crown, um, they started rebalancing some of the existing uniques, like um, they rebalanced Eagle Horn, uh, they rebalanced um, some of the other items. I'm trying to see if I've got like a decent number in here, but... In, in general, they started to get an idea of what items had good itemization. And they started to go down that pathway. They're like, okay, well, people really enjoyed things like Fists of Hate and Frostburns and, um, you know, like the, the Tempest Helm or like the Vasily's Prayer that were more open and allowed the characters to have control over the, how they designed things. So they started introducing other unique items in the most recent patches, like Pain Gorger's Gauntlets, Beast Fall Boots, um, and, uh, and even more open aspects, like the aspect of adaptability. Uh, we can type in uh, adaptability. Uh, the aspect of adaptability is a pretty nice one. Um, it's a new one that they just added in, which is very open. And they've started to realize, I feel like, in, in even in the creation of the unique items, that making the unique items more generic, making them more open, uh, was the right way to go. Uh, because Godslayer's Crown was very, very, very good, right? To Bolt's Will, a very, very good item. But also very open very uh, very open-ended creativity-wise. Like, you could literally use it on just about any character. Um, Overlords, uh, or the uh, Vanished Lords Talisman, also very open. And uh, I, honestly, a lot of people have really fallen in love with this. It's, uh, it's a very nice item. It can be utilized across multiple classes. It's not specifically limited to any specific ability, although it is pigeonholed a little bit into the overpower category, so you kind of have to be set up for overpowering. Um... Even the items like the Tacits of the Dawning Sky, which is a highly defensive item, so it gets used a little bit less because we don't always need the defense that it provides, but it's a better crafted item than some of the others. Um, I would like to see another um, damage reduction stat on these, though. Uh, the 9% control impaired duration kind of sucks. I, I feel like they probably should have put some DR on these. And um, even things like Blood Moon Breaches, which are a little bit more open. Um, and that's kind of the way that things are going, right? So you, you start to see that, like, in the beginning, when they first started, they were a little bit more restrictive about how they released their items, what the items were for. They had very specific purposes, like Waxing Gibbous was specifically for Shred. Uh, Insatiable Furry was specifically for Werewolf Druids. Webat I mean, uh, 
were bear druids. Mad Wolf Glee was specifically for uh, werewolf skills and so forth and so on. And so you end up with this situation where, you know, everything is very finite and very specific to specific classes. If I'm not a wolf druid, well, I don't care about Mad Wolf's Glee. If I'm not a bear druid, well, I don't care about Insatial Fury um, and so forth and so on. However, when it came to things like God Slayer's Crown or Tacits of the Dawning Sky or Banished Lord's Talisman, um, we get into a situation where it's not so much that anymore. Now it's more of a situation of, well, can I take advantage of this item, right? Not this item is useless to me because I'm not that build or I'm not that character, but more or less, can I take advantage of the way that this item works? And so the itemization has slowly started to creep over to the right side. Um, and, uh, and I really have a lot of fun with a lot of these newer uniques. The, the, the newer uniques that they've been putting out have been pretty good. Now, I do think that some of the newer uniques that I've been putting out are not really the greatest. Um, specifically, you know, like, like I said, the unsung aesthetic wraps, uh, the mutilator plates. Um, there's, there's a couple of them that are just very, very specific. And, and while I do think that there's a place for very specific uniques in a game, I don't necessarily think that the game should be primarily made up of them, if that makes sense. And, and as of right now... Um, if we were to tally up all the unique items, and of course I've got uh, sunlight blinding my camera here, um, but if we were to tally up all the unique items in Diablo 4 at the current time, um, what you would end up with is primarily very specific. Um, let's let's go take a look real quick, and let's let's just do a quick, you know, like one, two, three. We'll go over all the items, and we're going to talk about like whether or not they are specific uniques or whether they are more open-ended. So let's go up to um, Diablo4.life. Uh, Diablo4.life has a really nice uh, unique page here. Let's start with Barbarian. Um, is Butcher's Cleaver specific or generic? It's generic. Um, but it does have a very specific purpose with fears and slows, and that does make it a little bit more specific than it probably should be. Uh, Ramalani's Magnum Opus, very generic. Um, it is specific to Barbarian, but the whatever skill that you use with Ramalandis is not determined. Um, Azure Wrath, it's a little too specific. It's specific to core skills, and it's also specific to the Barbarian, and it's just, it's not really all that useful within the game. It's way too specific. Doombringer, very generic. Ancient's Oath, very specific to Steel Grasp. Hellhammer, very specific to Upheaval. Overkill, very specific to Death Blow. Uh, Fields of Crimson, very specific to not only bleed skills, but also rupture ability specific. Um, Grandfather, very generic. Uh, Battle Trance, very specific to Frenzy, but Frenzy is just a basic skill, and because of that, it's actually less generic than you might think. You pretty much just utilize this with Frenzy, and then you can build your Barbarian however you want otherwise, which is pretty cool. Uh, Melted Art of Sail Egg, very generic. Banished Lord's Talisman, very generic. 100,000 steps, uh, very specific. Not only does it require you to use Ground Stomp, but it also requires you to use the Walking Arsenal key passive, uh, which really restricts it within the Barbarian build. Penitent Greaves, uh, very generic. Flicker Step, very generic. Rage of Heracroth, this one is medium. It's kind of generic, but it's also kind of not, because it specifically has to do with bleeding, so it's a barbarian bleed item, and then on top of that, it also reduces cooldowns of non-ultimate skills whenever you inflict bleeding on elites. Um, it's also very specific because of the elite modifier here, which I think is honestly terrible. And so, in general, when you look at an item like that, I think the, um, the real problem with Rage of Herogoth is that it is highly specific within the barbarian character um, because of all of the various like damage on Tuesday modifiers that are going on within the, the way that the unique item works. Uh, razor Plate, extremely generic. Soul Brand, um, extremely generic but also very badly itemized in my opinion. It, it needs some work for it to become better, I feel like. Um, Goer's Devastating Grips, highly specific to Whirlwind. So if you're not using Whirlwind, you're not using Gover's Devastating Grips. Fist of Fate, highly generic. Frostburns, highly generic. Pain Gorgers, highly generic. Tusk Helm of Jorts the Mighty. This is one of the new ones that was added uh, when I was talking about how they were finally getting it. And Tusk Helm of Jorts the Mighty is an example of good itemization. It's Barbarian, and it's bar Barbarian Berserk. 
But other than that, it's a very generic item that you can use across many different Barbarian builds as long as you're using the Berserk ability. And the Berserk ability is not tied specifically to the key passive either, so you can get the effect of this without having to be tied to a specific key passive, which makes this a highly generic and very powerful item, by the way. Tuskel Majoritz the Mighty is amazing. Um, it's one of the few helmets within the game that I think actually does compete with, um, with uh, Harlequin Crest Shaka. I feel like it actually does compete with Harley Quinn Crest, um, as well as Andy's. It's a, it's a very powerful choice for Barbarians damage-wise. Um, and Arl's Visage, extremely generic. Uh, Harley Quinn Crest, extremely generic. God Slayer, extremely generic. Temerity, very generic, and recently has actually been beefed up quite a bit. Um, it's a lot more powerful than it used to be. Tassets of the Dawning Sky is a little bit too uh, pigeonholed into the defensive category, and I think it doesn't really do the defensive category as well as it should. Um, I'd like to see... Because they're highly defensive pants, and I'd like to see them beefed up a little bit in terms of their defensiveness. Because if they're going to be highly defensive pants, they should be they should be so good defensively that if somebody really needs defense, they're going to throw these on, not something else, right? And right now, um, they're missing two defensive stats. I think as defensive pants, they should probably have all defensive stats as opposed to... Um, two defensive and two non-defensive. Also, resistance to all elements is not exactly the best defensive stat out there because most people can hit 70% resistances without all resistance on their pants. So this also, again, the resistance to all elements may not necessarily be the best to put on there either. Um, they could probably incorporate this into here and then uh, put a different defensive stat there. Tabalt's will, extremely um, a good item for generic builds. And honestly, just very, very powerful offensively with not really a whole lot of defensive capa capacity. Um, there are pants that I love to put on my characters, but they're also pants that I love to take off my characters when I'm starting to get my booty cheek smacked because I realize immediately that these are highly offensive pants and not defensive in nature. Uh, Ring of Red Fear is a little bit too specific, although it does have three skills on the list. So it's kind of like in the middle, generic specific. Uh, Ring of the Ravenous is um, a little generic. Even though it does apply Ren's Bleed, it does work with all brawling skills, which is pretty cool. So I would rate this one in the generic category. Mother's Embrace, generic. Ring of the Star of the Sky is generic. And X Falls, generic. All right. So let's take a look at some of the other classes real quick. We're going to go over we're going to go over all these real quick cuz I I like uh, I like going over these. All right. So let's go over the druid. Waxing Gibbous, highly specific, right? Highly specific. Um, we already did that one. Flesh Render is very generic. Um, it doesn't really require a whole lot of specific stuff. It works based off Debilitating Roar or Blood Howl, um, but as long as you're using either one of those, it just does poison damage. It increases poison damage. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's, oh, actually, you know what? Let's put it in the middle. It's right in the middle between generic and, and specific. Um, it does have an option for both werewolf and werebear, and there's also options because debilitating roar and blood howl can be converted into other forms of skills like earth skills, storm skills, uh, werewolf skills, werebear skills, etc. So, it, it, honestly, this is probably on the more generic side. Um, we also have uh, Bink. It keeps uh, messing me up here because I keep clicking on stuff. Uh, Great Staff of the Crone is specific-ish, but because it's a basic skill and you may be utilizing any other number of skills to your advantage in combination with this, um, it's a little bit more generic, and it's actually been one of the more popular items on the Druid. Uh, a very on Spear like Hander, generic, Dolman Stone, extremely specific, and honestly kind of bad for that. Melted Heart, uh, we already talked about. Uh, Banished Lord Talisman, we already talked about. Um, do, 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 Mad Wolf's Glee, highly specific. Insatiable Worry, highly specific. Um, do, 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 unsec unsung Aesthetic Wraps, highly specific. And um, Tempest Roar, very generic, actually. Um, I've actually been really surprised with Tempest Roar because it comes in handy in so many different builds and so many different ways you want to make characters. Yes, it has to do with storm skills, um, but basically it makes it so that all storm skills are werewolf skills, and then you can utilize those storm skills as werewolf skills. So you, you can set up tons of different characters with this. You can set up werewolf tornado druids. You can set up werewolf lightning storm druids. You can set up, you know, like a uh, freaking... Um, uh, hurricane can become a werewolf skill. 
uh, cyclone armor can become a werewolf skill, etc., etc., etc. It's it's actually a surprisingly good piece of equipment generically uh, because of how many different things you can do with that helmet. Uh, same thing with Vasily's prayer, prayer, which does the opposite. It turns earth skills into werebear skills instead of storm skills into werewolf skills. Same, pretty much the same principle. Um, and then uh, we go down a little bit further and. Um, I crash my PC here. <laughs> I think I did crash my PC. Boom. There it goes. Boom. There it is. Boom. There it is. Let's, uh, let's just pull it up on another page, shall we? It doesn't really hurt anything. Bink. All right, here we go. So, um, so going down the list, Dolman Stone. Uh, where do we leave off? Uh, da, 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 uh, Storm's companion, highly specific. Not only does it have to do with companions, it has to do with wolf companions, and it also makes the wolves into storm compan abilities. So it. It's companion and the companions now become storm. So it's not just companions, it's companion storm, which is highly specific. And it's also kind of badly optimized. I, I'd like to see some further changes to the way that this works, but um, maybe some companion skill damage instead of companion movement speed would be nice. Uh, there's a bunch of different options. Um, do, 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 do. What else do we have here? Hunter's Zenith is um, a kind of a highly specific item that has to do with shapeshifting. It's it's an oddity. I, I feel like it's maybe more in the middle because of the way that it kind of works more generically. But um, not really, honestly, like, like the best item in the, in the list. Um, Eridaz Inexorable Will is highly generic. It just requires any ultimate, um, and it does the effect, which is not bad. Um, and then uh, let's move on to the next one. We're going to cover all the classes real quick. So Necromancer, Black River, highly specific to Corpse Explosion. Um, Corpse Explosion is a rather interesting ability, though, uh, which can be utilized in a myriad of different ways. But this is specific to Corpse Explosion as a main damage skill, uh, which does make it highly specific. Lidless Wall is an ultimate skill that just about like anybody can utilize. And although it is very specific to Bone Storm, it's rather interesting to say that this is a generic item because it's a defensive item. Um, and Bone Storm is something that is not really a, a build-defining ability, which means that you can utilize any ultimate that you want to. This one is just specifically utilizing Bone Storm, which could be on any number of characters. Bone Spear, Bone Spirit, you could be a, a, a melee, you know, like run in there, beat everything to death, Necromancer. You could be a caster, you can, you know, be blood or shadow there's tons of different ways that you can set up bone storm bone storm can actually be blood or shower sh uh, shadow damage i believe uh through one of the aspects it's actually a, a highly um just a highly customizable I uh, skill uh, and it is based around that skill but that skill itself is utilizable in many different ways uh doombringer generic um bloodless scream is very specific has to do with darkness and chilling enemies. Now, there are a bunch of different darkness skills. Um, it is specific to the darkness category, but it is generic within the darkness category, which makes it sort of in the middle. Um, do, 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 do. Death Speaker's Pendant, highly specific to Blood Surge. Um, Greaves of the Empty Tomb, highly specific to Sever, uh, as well as Mutilator Plate, highly specific to Blood Lance. Uh, blood Artisan's Curios. Now, this is an oddity because it spawns Bone Spirits for free as long as you have Blood Orbs, and there is a myriad of ways to spawn Blood Orbs. So it's actually kind of just free damage for any character who has large amounts of Blood Orbs on the battlefield at any given time, which is actually kind of cool. And I, I would lean more towards specific on this one, but... It does have a generic-like quality in that it's really just based on blood orbs, and as long as you're generating blood orbs in some way, you can take advantage of this. And there's, like I said, there's tons of ways to generate blood orbs. Um, and not just blood skills, either. You don't have to be a blood necromancer to generate blood skill, uh, blood orbs. Um, Howl from Below, very specific to Corpse Explosion. Uh, do, 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 do. Death Slayer's Visage, very specific to Bone Spear. Um... 
Blood Moon Breaches is more generic. It's curses and minions and overpower damage. There's a lot going on here. And it's actually kind of an interesting ability as far as uh, that's concerned. It's, it, it's, it's mildly generic. Um, and then we have uh, Ring of Mandeln, which is sort of generic, but it does require you to be using minions. Um, and the more minions you have, the more damage they do. So it's more specific in the max minion category. It's something that you're going to use with as many minions as you possibly can. Ring of the Sacrilegious Soul is a very nice generic item, which works with skeletons, corpse explosions, tendrils, basically all corpse-like abilities on like an automatic timer. And... Um, it doesn't really limit to any specific type. You can either be a minion or non-minion. You can be corpse explosion or non-corpse explosion. And you can use corpse tendrils or not. Like, it's just, it kind of just like all-encompassing, very useful generic item. Uh, Rogue. Condemnation, pretty generic, but it does require you to be using combo points. Um, Shears Kanjar, very generic and very effective. It does require you to be using that weapon, though, which is um, specific to dagger-based abilities, so this doesn't work with the bow rogue basics. Um, we also have uh, Sky Hunter, which is very specific to the precision set. Wind Force, which is... Um, it's pretty generic, but it also kind of builds around core skills as well as the impetus passive, which is, it, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's specific-ish, but it's not like, it's not like this one, which requires you to use a specific thing like precision, which is a key passive. Um, this one doesn't really require to you to use key passive, but it is kind of built around specific passives. Uh, Eagle Horn, very specific to penetrating shot. Um, Word of a Con, very specific to Reign of Arrows. Although Reign of Arrows is a, a um, an ultimate, it's also very specifically set up around imbuement skills uh, for Reign of Arrows. So it's it's very specific in that it's imbuement and Reign of Arrows together. Um, Beast Ball Boots is very generic. It's one of the newer uniques that's been added, and it's actually surprisingly good. Um, Scoundrel Leathers is very specific. Not only is it specific to traps, it is also specific to Inner Sight, which is um, which would prevent you from using the combo points or the preparation uh, abilities. And so not only are you limited to using Inner Sight, but you're also now limited to using traps. Um, and it's, it's a very specific piece of equipment. I don't like it. Um, Grasp of Shadow is quite generic. Um, not only does it give you plus four to all core skills, which was kind of surprising. It's one of the only items that has that. There's like maybe like one or two other in the game. It also gives you a chance to just summon Shadow Clones that mimics your attacks. Uh, I don't particularly like the way the Shadow Clone works, to be perfectly honest. But it's a very generic piece of equipment. Um... Cowl of the Namus, very generic. It actually is a surprisingly good piece of equipment for lucky hit builds. Um, do, 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 do. Eyes in the Dark, absolutely a terrible piece of equipment in my opinion. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't even like the way that it works um, before they fixed it, and after they fixed it, it still doesn't really work all that well, to be perfectly honest. Um, it's better than it was before, I'll say that, but it's still highly specific, linked directly to Death Trap, and it also doesn't really even do all that much for death trap in my opinion the multiplier is nice and if you're a trap assassin you're probably going to take a look at that but you could probably also get the same multiplier from something like tabolts which gives 40 percent. this one gives 50. this one's always active whenever you're unstoppable and this one is uh only for death trap itself which when you look at it that way you kind of say okay well maybe this one might be better than this one for that reason uh, it, it's it's kind of an odd thing. I don't, I'm not really what, sure what to think about that one. Um, and then Writhing Band of Trickery, uh, pretty generic. Just any subterfuge skill uh, leaves behind the decoy trap. I mean, overall, um, as you can see there, we're still mainly in specific. Flame Scar, very specific to Incinerate. Oculus, very specific to the Teleport Enchantment, but not necessarily specific in general, because I think all sorceresses tend to use Teleport. Um, Staff of Endless Rage, very specific to Fireball. Staff of Lumasam, very specific to Charge Bolts. Um, Isidora's Overflowing Cameo, um, not particularly specific to any one class, but does have a Crackling Energy uh, affix, which is very specific to Crackling Energy builds. And unlike the Necromancer, which has a very easy time making Blood Orbs, not all sorceresses have a very easy time making Crackling Energy, uh, which is a difference there, which does make Isidora's Overflowing Cameo very specific. Um, Asu's Heirloom, very generic. Uh, Raymond of the Infinite, pretty generic, actually, although a very, it's a very offensive item in a very defensive slot, which can sometimes make your character extremely weak. Um, 
Gloves of the Illuminator, very specific to Fireball. And Starfall Coronet, very specific to Meteor, um, and so forth and so on. And, and, and you know, as you look through here, you'll see, like, there's a lot of very specific items. Uh, Ice Heart Bryce is... Um, Fro it's it, this one is actually quite generic actually because it just means the monster needs to be frozen there's tons of ways that you can potentially freeze monsters and um i mean it's not it, it, not that difficult to achieve this um you can do it across multiple different characters you can use frosties you can use all sorts of things to achieve that freezing effect and uh, this one's not really all that difficult um to to take advantage of so very generic item um, Blue Rose, very specific to the Ice Spikes, the Cold Damage, the Frozen. Um, it's really going to be built around a character that freezes a lot. Um, crowd Control specific tends to be more niche because it doesn't work versus bosses and things like that, which is also an issue. So being able to freeze enemies um, is nice, but it'd be also be nice if there was some way that it could potentially be useful against, you know, bosses. Town Rush is iridescent loop, extremely generic and very useful. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. I mean, w overall, we are looking at, I think, for the most part in the game right now, majorly specific items with them working toward less specifics. I mean, at this point, I feel like we've got so many specific uniques, so, so many that are that are very specifically crafted for very specific characters that we really have to go through the process of saying, you know, like, at what point do you just simply stop adding any specific uniques at all and you start working more toward the generics, right? Like, we have enough specific uniques. Let's go toward generic uniques. Um, I mean, in Diablo 2, they did very similar is they have a lot of generics and then they have a very ha small handful of specifics for those classes but um i mean I, I think it's still important to have the specifics the specific uniques the specific aspects um but it's also important to have a lot of generics as well to help the system flourish to help create that personal agency to help give that um that feeling that you've created something um i just realized i've been going for nearly two hours and um I, it wasn't really my intention to make this two hours long, but uh, there's just so much to talk about with itemization. Um, it's a very uh, it's a topic that I'm very passionate about because I do enjoy uh, quite a lot going over stuff like this and talking about the way that itemization works. and uh, And I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about itemization. Um, I mean, for those of you who actually watched all two hours of the video. Um, you know, what, what do you guys think about what, what I'm talking about? Um, do you think Diablo 4 is headed in the right direction? Do you think they're headed in the wrong direction? Um, do you think that there's itemization in Diablo 2 that you would consider poor? Um, do you think uh, Diablo 2's itemization is the best in the world? Uh, what do you think about my Diablo 3 examples? Um, I mean, we could talk about this and, and debate this topic for a long period of time, but I feel like this is probably a topic that developers have been talking about and debating for a very long period of time, too. Um, Diablo 4, I think, fell into a lot of the traps that existed uh, prior and had been fixed prior um, to many other, you know, titles. Um, and I think that it's also important to talk very quickly about one last thing. Um, and I, I know this video has gone on for a very long period of time, but why did eye level get invented in the first place? Um... I think that if you go back and you look at kind of like the history of the way that item level sort of came into play, um, what you're going to find out is that eye level kind of only exists to exploit the player. Um, item level, uh, and of course I got this set up all wrong. You know what, let's log back into my main PC real quick here. Now that she's rebuted. Rebuted? I don't even know why she uh, she shut down, actually. Rebuted. Uh, do -do -do. Anyway, we don't really... We don't really need to talk about this anyway.
<laughs> of course, it's going to pop up with some crazy stuff as soon as I reboot my PC. I'm going to have to go over this later. Oh, I did not mean to snort in you guys' ear. The, um... <laughs> So uh, let's just let's just talk about it this way. All right, I, I don't need any visual aids. We'll just we'll just get it through it, and then we'll we'll be done. In World of Warcraft, um, the goal of MMOs of Final Fantasy XIV, the goal of World of Warcraft, the goal of MMOs in general, is usually to keep you playing. They want to keep you online. They want to keep a high active player count. Um, they want to force players to continue to play, even if um, you know you're decked out in all the best pieces of equipment no demand in diablo 2 when you have the best piece of equipment there's no way for the game to take that piece of equipment away from you in world of warcraft in final fantasy 14 all they have to do is increase the item power cap that's it the item power cap represents a way to force the player to regrind out all their equipment now, in Diablo 2 and in Diablo 3 and in Diablo 4, there exists a way to do that already. It's called Seasons, or Ladder, right? Seasons and Ladder were invented specifically to get rid of exploited and cheated items in Diablo 2. Um, the, the developers over at Moonbeast, um, which are the same developers from Diablo 2, were talking about this. They, when they originally developed Ladder, it was literally just a way to destroy all of the exploited items, the, the cheated items, the duped items, and so forth and so on, right? Well... That exists within all of the versions of, of Diablo. It's Diablo 2, Diablo 3, Diablo 4, right? So why does there also need to be an item power cap to also further force the player base to stay online and do more? Like, have they ever really increased the item cap within a season? Probably not. I've never seen it so far in Diablo 4, right? So it begs the question, why use the item power mechanic at all when the item power mechanic is really only there to force players to log on and regrind out their equipment, right? I mean, it would still work for the Eternal Realm. So, like, all my Eternal Realm characters from, like, Season 0 are still using, like, you know, eight 800 item power items, where the cap is now 925. So they actually have to regrind out all their equipment, right? Because all their equipment sucks. But when it comes to seasonal, because you have to play your character each season when the season is created, it doesn't matter how many times they increase the item power cap, because the item power cap is always going to be the same at the beginning of the season as it is in the end of the season, um, or at least so it has been so far, right? And so the having the item power mechanic for World of Warcraft doesn't really make a lot of sense, because it doesn't really we just don't really understand exactly what that represents in terms of how it changes things right so world of warcraft was using that as a way to get you to log in and regrind out your characters but diablo 4 doesn't need that um and i feel like it, they would be much better off if they moved away from that entirely Anyway, as always, I do appreciate you guys and gals joining me for these um, really long game rants. Um, I know this content isn't for everyone. Not everybody's going to be interested in, you know, listening to me talk for two hours, uh, which, you know, by the way, if you put it on two times speed and you listen to me like a hyper chipmunk, it'll only take you one hour. So as always, thanks for watching and uh, keep watching.